Hi, this is Professor Makimura from the History Department. Uh, we're now going to do uh, the history of China from the beginning to the early modern period, uh, around 1500. Um, and so let's get cracking. Here we go. History of China. Boom. From the Shah to the Ming. <laughs> okay. So I start with the Shah, but the Shah dynasty if, is probably not real. <laughs> so the grand historian Su Ma Chen, the founder of Chinese history, talked about the Shah dynasty according to uh, his research, but uh, there's been no evidence whatsoever to corroborate the existence of the Shah dynasty. So you can probably safely put it as legendary. However, the second dynasty that he talked about, the Shang dynasty, which for a long time, basically until the 20th century, many people thought was also legendary and not real, turns out to be historical. <laughs> it's like the city of Troy. It wasn't just a legend, it's actually real. Um, and in the case of the Shang, we don't know if it really did start here, but according to Sun Ma Qian, if, if his numbers are accurate, it started around here. Um, the Shang dynasty's tail end is certainly real. Okay, and the reason why the tail end is certainly real is because we found the last capital of the Shang Dynasty. And in the last capital of the Shang Dynasty, we found these uh, you know, archeological you know, evidences where you have bronze working, you have writing. Um, and from that writing, we're able to reconstruct what kind of government and what kind of religion they had. And obviously it's their last capital, so they have a city. So boom, you have all the things you need to be called a civilization. Which means that for China then, uh, as a civilization, it emerges by around 1100 BC or so, right? It is later compared to the other three, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus Valley. But, you know, regardless, China is the longest lasting or longest continuous civilization because starting around 1100 BC with no major, you know, breaks in terms of its character of the civilization. So, for example, the Mesopotamian civilization of the Sumerians uh, and uh, the Egyptian civilization of the pharaohs and all that, they, they all essentially, they, they change their main fundamental character when they become monotheistic. In the case of Egypt, it's conquered by the Romans, and then the Romans later become monotheistic under you know, Christianity. And in the case of Mesopotamia, uh, <clears throat> although the Persians conquer them, I think the Persians can still be considered part of the uh, uh, old, you know, polytheistic civilization, even though they only have two gods, um, two real gods. Uh, when Islam arrives, that's when for sure that that civilization breaks. And in the case of India, the Indus Valley civilization collapses, and you get the uh, you know, Vedic culture. So all three of them have a have a clear break in them. Whereas in the case of China, China keeps going, and it doesn't break. So that's why, you know, uh, Chinese civilization is uh, the longest lasting continuous civilization to this day. Now, when it first starts off, it starts off along the Yellow River. So sometimes people call this the Yellow River civilization. Right? Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, Egypt is the Nile civilization, the Indus River Valley is obviously the Indus River Valley, and then the Yellow River civilization. So you could call it by the rivers, that's another way, but <clears throat> sorry. Okay, so the Shang Dynasty, um, from the tail end that we know, what we do know is that they had writing and these writings are etched on these things called oracle bones. So oracle bones are various bones. Sometimes it's the shoulder blade of deers, sometimes it's the shell of a dead turtle. Um, and on, on these shells, on these bones are etched these things that we now know are words. And what seemed to have happened is that the priests use these bones to divine what would happen, to see what would happen in the future. So you drill a little hole in them, like in a deer, deer's uh, shoulder bone or in a turtle shell, and you take a very hot rod and you stick it into that hot, you stick it into that hole, and then the shell or the bone cracks. And by looking at the cracks, you go, hmm, it's going to rain tomorrow. Or go, the priest would go, mm, your majesty, I don't think it's a good idea for us to go to war. The gods say we'll lose. <laughs> and the government then acts accordingly because it's the message from the gods. So it is a theocratic government in which the king is 
I don't think he's necessarily the chief priest, but the king is one of the priests in, in, in the divination. And the king is the intermediary between the gods and humans on earth. Now, uh, according to Sima Qian, the last Shang king was a terrible king, and so he was overthrown, and he was replaced by the Zhou. And the Zhou dynasty is important for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it is during this dynasty that you have a lot of philosophies that pop up. Three of the most important is, of course, Confucianism, Taoism, and legalism. Another reason why the Zhou dynasty is important is because it is during this dynasty that the theocracy of China more or less begins to come to an end. Uh, basically, the Zhou dynasty claims that the reason why they were able to defeat the Shang dynasty, even though they were weaker initially, is because the Zhou dynasty lost the mandate of heaven. So they start talking about why governments rule. And they say governments rule not because the gods told them to rule. The governments rule, uh, governments are in place because heaven, sorry, because the most virtuous person is supposed to rule. And heaven is keeping an eye on if the king is being virtuous or not. And if the king is not virtuous, then through the people, heaven will speak and the people can overthrow the king. So in that way, the theocracy that had lasted through the Shang dynasty comes to an end with the Zhou dynasty, right? And China becomes, uh, tr transitions uh, to a more, you know, uh, I, well, I guess to a more mature political phase. It's, like, it's, better, than a it's better than a pure theocracy, that's for sure, where you're just sticking uh, hot rods into animal bones and saying, hmm, this is going to happen next. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is the northern part of China. The southern part of China, or today the central part of China, is the Yangtze River Valley. Um, back then it's the southern part of China. And the Yangtze River Valley had its own cultures. I wouldn't call it a civilization because they may, not have, they may have had cities, but they don't have writing there yet. So the Yangtze River cultures basically come into contact with the Yellow River civilizations, and through the contacts, they then basically slowly fuse and turn into one giant civilization, which is called Chinese civilization. Now, uh, the Yangtze River uh, region uh, housed many peoples that didn't necessarily identify themselves as being Chinese initially. But what happens is through the interactions between the North and the South, they will begin to use the same kind of technological abilities, the same kind of, you know, uh, pottery, the same kind of bronze working, this, you know, the same kind of, you know, writing, and and uh, and in in that process, they will eventually merge and become one civilization, one culture, um, which isn't that hard to understand, right? <clears throat> um, okay. So, what happens to the uh, Zhou Dynasty? Well. <laughs> so the Zhou dynasty, uh, according to Sima Qian, uh, here's what happens to them. Initially, they govern well, uh, and the, the people are okay with that. But around the, after about like a third uh, of its history, so around 700 BC, or 770 BC, something like that, um, one of the Zhou kings is a terrible king, and he loses the support of the aristocrats throughout the country. And when he loses the support of the aristocrats throughout the country, his capital city is sacked. And when he is killed, what, a, a few of his family survivors flee the city and they establish a new city and make it the new capital of the Zhou. This is called the Eastern Zhou. The Zhou dynasty that came before that is called the Western Zhou. So the Eastern Zhou is about 500 years long. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And what happens in the Eastern Zhou? Well, because the king had basically uh, lost the support of the aristocrats, the aristocrats in the countryside begin to declare themselves to be rulers in their own might, uh, in their own right, not might, sorry. And as rulers in their own right, they begin to wage wars against each other. This early period is called the Spring and Autumn period. The Spring and Autumn Annals is supposedly a historical text written by Confucius himself. 
So the spring and autumn period is a period in which these aristocrats constantly fight against each other. And then over time, what happens is uh, these uh, cities gobble each other up and cities become states. So instead of city states where each city is its own country, now you actually get countries that have many cities inside, right? The strongest city conquers other cities and becomes you know, a bigger territorial country. And in the second half of the Eastern Zhou, you get what is called the warring states where seven major countries fight against each other for supremacy. By this point in time, nobody takes the Zhou king seriously. Uh, these seven countries all have kings. Uh, the, the leaders all declare themselves to be kings. And these seven countries are Yan, Qi, Chu, Zhao, Wei, Han, and Qin. It is these seven states. Qin is huge in this map, but initially the Qin is like around here and it was tiny at the beginning of the Zhou. What happened is that the Qin slowly expanded this way and slowly expanded this way and began to get non-Chinese people to be part of the Qin state. Chu, which is along the Yangtze River, was always you know, not fully you know, of the Yellow River civilization, and they always thought of themselves as slightly different anyway. Uh, but these guys also expanded southward to, you know, uh, incorporate, you know, people who were not been, quote unquote, civilized or cynified yet. And <clears throat> they became the main rivals of the Qin Dynasty. Uh, Yan and Zhao initially were actually also very strong and were rivals because they also got the Xiongnu, the northern barbarians, to be on their side, and they had hired them to fight on their behalf as well. But in the end, ultimately, Qin will be the kingdom that will unify all of China for the first time in 221 BC. Um, it's a great story, but uh, you know, I'm not going to really talk about it too much. <clears throat> all right. Because all seven of these countries were fighting against each other and there were life and death struggles, uh, they built giant walls uh, along the border <laughs> against each other. And once the Qin Dynasty conquered all of them, that what they did was, what the first emperor of China, the, the king of Qin at the time did, was he broke down all the walls in between these countries and kept the walls that was facing the northern barbarians intact and linked them together. And so the first Great Wall of China is built after the unification of China by Qin. So the king of Qin declares himself to be not just king, but emperor. He says the title king has been used by too many people, and now it's a lame title, so I'm now going to call myself emperor. And the word emperor, Huangdi, uh, so Qin Shi Huangdi, Qin, the, literally it is Qin first emperor. <laughs> and emperor uh, Huang Di is literally a compound word where the word Huang and the word Di both mean, uh, well, Huang I think means divine and Di means uh, Lord. <laughs> so he's no longer human in a sense, right? He says that he's, he's beyond human. He, he is the, the ultimate ruler of this known world. And what he's going to do is he's going to do what the Persians did by creating a, and creating a unified empire. He's going to unify weights and measures, He's going to unify the language. Uh, so this is actually something that the Persians didn't do, but he basically tells, he, he gets all the people around the country to stop using the writing system that they were using and start using the writing system that Chin is using. So everybody uses the same writing system. Uh, he, uses, he gets all the carts in the country to use the same axle length as the Chin carts so that when they go along the roads, they can go along the same tracks. Um, and probably, uh, Another one that he does is he, uh, two fateful ones that he does is one, he does massive construction projects, one's the Great Wall. And the other one is a massive palace and a massive tomb for himself. <laughs> it's like, makes no sense because he, he's searching for immortality and he's also building a tomb for himself, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing he does is he tries to unify thought. And by unified thought, what he's going to do is he's going to outlaw Confucianism and Taoism, and everybody's going to follow legalism, the ideology of the Qin. The reason why the Qin became 
the most powerful state in China. So these things backfire. Pisses off a lot of people. It pisses off the intellectuals by, you know, by forcing people to all you know, abandon their previous studies and only use legalism. Uh, it pisses off the ordinary workers who are drafted to build a giant wall and a giant castle of a palace and a giant tomb and all that. It's like, just imagine if you're like down here or if you're all the way over here and you're ordered to come all the way over here to the capital to build a palace and then go all the way back. I mean, it's like, the hell? <laughs> Not be happy about that because <clears throat> you know there's no railroads back there. You got to walk all that distance. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so as soon as the first emperor dies, uh, the empire falls apart, and there is a massive rebellion. Now, when the massive rebellion clears, a new leader emerges, a fellow by the name of Liu Bang, and he will create the Han Dynasty. And the Han Dynasty basically is going to carry on some of the legacies of the Qin, but it's going to ameliorate some of its things. So, for example, uh, they basically say, we're not going to follow legalism. He, he, he's, he states that as a fact. We're not going to follow legalism. We're going to abolish all the laws that the legalists have implemented. At least that's what he says in his speech. But in reality, a lot of the mechanism of how the government is run is still going to be along legalist lines. So how do you ameliorate that? Well, uh, Liu Bang was from the south. He's from, uh, you know, from the area of Qi. And so what Liu Bang is going to do <laughs> is he's going to adopt Taoism. Taoism was very popular in the southern part of China along the Yangtze River Valley. So he's going to basically say, uh, we're going to follow the Taoist tenets. And one of the most important Taoist tenets is to be one with nature and to not do anything. So the government is basically not going to do massive construction projects anymore. So the people can rest and they can go back home. <laughs> the government is also going to adopt some Confucian elements uh, to establish court decorum, but we're not going to make it so that it's the thing that everybody needs to follow, like legalism was. So uh, the Han Dynasty starts off as sort of a way, to, you know, by learning from the past mistakes and by, you know, not being too strict, right? So in that sense, they're more like the Persians, where the Persians basically had, you know, some things that they that they enforce, like the royal road, like uh, you know, weights and measures, but you know, customs, religion, these things they left alone. You know, a similar kind of you know mix and match is going to happen in the Han Dynasty, where they're going to govern, but they're going to govern with a lighter touch than the Han Dynasty, uh, than the Qin Dynasty. And perhaps because of that, uh, the initial uh, years is actually uh, very uh, uh, positive. The people of the Han Dynasty like the imperial family, even though, or, or like the government, even though the imperial family is having a major uh, succession crisis and people are being killed left and right. So <laughs> when you read the historical text, you go, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, they, all these people are killing each other. But when you realize that they're just only talking about like, you know, literally what, like a thousand people killing each other at the very tippy top of society, you know, the palace intrigue. And for the vast majority of the people, 99.99% of the people, they're at home. The taxes are lighter. They don't have to do crazy, you know, uh, workloads. Life is good. <laughs> they don't care what's happening at the top. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, <clears throat> I think the other key thing is that because of that, the government basically, because the government doesn't do much, it just accumulates a lot of surplus. And with that accumulated surplus, uh, the martial emperor of the Han Dynasty, a fellow by the name of Han Wu Di, that's what the name literally means, martial emperor of the Han Dynasty. Han Wu Di leads uh, or orders his generals to uh, launch an expedition against the northern barbarians, the Xiongnu. Uh, this is because ever since uh, the Qin collapsed, the Xiongnu were more powerful than the Han Dynasty. Uh, and despite the existence of the Great Wall, uh, they were demanding tribute. And the Han, uh, the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, uh, Liu Bang, tried to fight against the Xiongnu but lost, so they were paying tribute. Um, and that relationship between the Xiongnu and the Han is finally going to come to an end when. Sorry, 
Uh, so this is the Han Dynasty. That relationship between the Han Dynasty and the Xiongnu is finally going to come to an end when Han Wudi launches these expeditions to defeat the Xiongnu. And from that point onwards, the Han Dynasty really will be the dominant entity in East Asia. They will, after defeat, you know, uh, you know, not only will they defeat the Xiongnu, I don't know if it's after, but not only will they defeat the Xiongnu, they will also conquer Northern Korea. They will conquer Northern Vietnam. And they will launch expeditions into Central Asia so that the city-states along the Silk Road between China and Rome, these city-states will fall under the sway of Han China. So that is the Han Dynasty. Right? Um, and so as an empire, it's the longest lasting empire, lasts for over 400 years. Right? Uh, the uh, Zhou dynasty is the longest lasting uh, dynasty because it lasted for 800 years, but its effective rule was only for like 200 something years. All right. <clears throat> it's not exactly surprising that the Chinese people today call themselves the Han people. Okay, so now let's finally get to Confucianism. And I'll talk a little bit about Taoism after this because, and I should probably also talk about Lisa. Right, so I'll talk about all three. Uh, with this. So Confucianism. Uh, the best place to get a sense of what Confucianism is all about is to go read the Analects. Analects is not a long book. Analects is a book uh, uh, compiled by Confucius' disciples uh, shortly after his death, so it's actually pretty accurate. And, uh, you know, one of his disciples asked Confucius, Master, What's what what's the what's the core of your idea? And Confucius says, Well, you know, it, it, this is it. And he goes, no, 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 Master, in one word, what's the core of your idea? Uh, kindness. Don't do unto others as you don't want done unto you. That's Confucius. <laughs> it's the golden rule. It literally is the golden rule. Now it's not the Western, it's not the Christian golden rule where it's do unto others as you want done unto you. Because in the Christian golden rule, if you uh, hear the good message and you like it, then it is now your duty to go spread that message. And, you know, you got to actively, proactively go out and do good things. The Confucian golden rule is just don't do bad things. <laughs> be a decent person. You don't have to be a good person by actively doing things, but be a decent person by not harming things, by not, by not pissing off other people. So... <clears throat> Why, is he, why does he say that? Uh, you know, what's his main uh, focus? Uh, Confucius' main focus is the fact that uh, China, when he's uh, running around, around 500 BC, is in a state of chaos. It's in the spring and autumn period. It's in the war. And it's going to shortly fall into the warring states period where people are constantly killing each other and there's all these wars going on. In fact, around the time of Confucius, two states from the Yangtze River Valley, or not Yangtze Valley, from the Yangtze River region, down here, uh, Wu and, and uh, Yue, Yue in Vietnamese is Viet, by the way. So Yu and Viet, uh, yeah. Wu and Yue, I can never pronounce this right. <laughs> Wu and Viet, uh, Yue, Wu and Yue basically launch expeditions to conquer huge chunks of the Yellow River region. And, you know, it's like this big shock. It's like, oh my God, why are we losing? Why is this war going on? What's going on? And his answer is, the reason why we're constantly fighting against each other and we can't even defend ourselves against our neighbors to the south is simple. The reason is because we have forgotten our past. And because we have forgotten our past, we have forgotten our culture, and we have forgotten how to treat each other with respect. And because we're not treating each other with respect, people are easily pissed off at each other, and that's why there's all this turmoil. So what we need to do is we need to study the past, recover the rituals, recover how our ancestors lived, and live accordingly. Then we can live in harmony like in the early Joe days. That's Confucius's answer. Now, Confucius himself isn't going to say this, but Confucius... Uh, the scholars who follow after Confucius and Mencius will ultimately say this. There are five human relationships. <clears throat> Parent-child, ruler-ruled, husband-wife, elder-younger, and friend-friend. There's these five human relationships. And as long as you get these five human relationships in order, 
society will be harmonious. Now notice here that there's nothing about humans and gods, right? And when Confucius is asked, what happens after you die? Confucius's answer in the Analects was, we don't know enough about this life now. Why do you have to worry about what happens after you die? <laughs> so because he doesn't talk about gods, because he doesn't talk about what happens after you die, Confucianism, as Confucius explains it, and as the early philosophers explained it, is a philosophy. It's not a religion yet. Okay, that's around 500 BC. Now, by 1080, so about 1,500 years after the death of Confucius, by 1080, Confucianism begins to turn into a religion. And the reason why it begins to turn into a religion is because people begin to add on to Confucianism. Well, Confucius was talking about all these rituals that people practice in the past. Some of these rituals are impossible to do today, but hey, we can simplify them. Here's the core message behind these rituals. So when somebody is born, here's the ceremony you should have. When somebody comes of age, here's a ceremony you should have. When somebody gets married, here's the ceremony you should have. When somebody dies, here's the Confucian ceremony you should have. And for the to be grateful to the man who created all this, let's create a shrine to Confucius. <laughs> and let's give offerings to Confucius on his birthday and you know on various occasions. Okay. So uh, how is this now different from a religion? You think about that, right? <laughs> So if you're Catholic, if you're born, you get the rite of baptism. And then at the coming of age, it's essentially like kind of confirmation. And then when you get married, you get married at a church. And then when you die, you get a funeral. <laughs> and on special occasions every year, you, you know, on the birthday of uh, Jesus Christ, you go to church and you have Christmas mass. And on Jesus's resurrection, you go to church and you go to the Easter. It's the same, right? So in terms of actual practice, Confucianism becomes a religion. So that's why today Confucianism can be both a philosophy and a religion, right? So there you go. Uh, I forgot to mention about Mencius. Well, I didn't forget, but I left it till now. Uh, Mencius is the other great Confucian scholar. He comes after the death of Confucius. Uh, Mencius's book is called The Mencius. And Mencius uh, talks about three things that's important in his book. And one is, one, the right to revolution. Uh, the Zhou dynasty was created because the Shan kings were rebellious. Um, so if, uh, because the Shan kings were terrible. So if the king is not acting like a true king, he's not a king. And therefore, you can overthrow him. <laughs> Right now, there's a, a multiple step process. First, what you got to do is the kings and the minister, sorry, the ministers and the relatives need to tell the king, Your Majesty, you're not acting like a true king. Please act like a true king. And if he refuses, then it's now the duty of the relatives to get rid of the king and replace him with a different king. And if the relatives can't even do that, then at that point, the people can overthrow uh, the king. So there you go. All right. <clears throat> The other thing that uh, Manchus says is that uh, you need uh, public schools and you need land reform. Uh, you need public schools because Manchus says that human nature is good. This is the third important thing that he says, human nature is good. But because hum just because human nature is good doesn't mean that human beings are automatically going to be good. You have to nurture that goodness. So in order to nurture that goodness, we have to build schools. And these schools ought to be public. Government ought to build these schools and kids should be able to go to these schools for free. Now, the other thing he says is in order for society to function, like Confucius says, people need to not starve. And so we need to do land reform so that poor people have land once again, and that land is redistributed more or less evenly. Not exactly equally, because he's not asking for that, but the bare minimum needs to be taken care of for people. So, you know, uh, Mencius is a very important Confucian scholar. And notice that he's talking, he's running around like 300 BC, and he's already talking about how whether human nature is good or bad. Um, this debate between, you know, Mencius and Shunzi, Shunzi is the other Confucian scholar uh, that's important who says that uh, human nature is bad, but we're not gonna talk about Shunzi in this class. Uh, you know, it's a debate that, you know, is replicated in the West as well. So you have uh, Thomas Hobbes and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Hobbes saying that human nature is bad and Jean-Jacques Rousseau saying that human nature is good. Okay. Um, 
it's interesting in China the with it, with China people basically think that human nature is good Manchus basically won the argument against Shinzo in the West until the 20th century Thomas Hobbes had won the argument human nature is bad <laughs> and because human nature is bad because you can't trust human beings when you build governments you have to build it with checks and balances that's the whole reason why you have the current American system right so Thomas Hobbes is running around in the uh, 1600s the US Constitution is built in the 1700s or is drafted in the 1700s 80s, you know, it comes out of that Thomas Hobbes is saying that human nature is bad. Uh, uh, but I think it's after the backlash from the Victorians that in the 20th century, people begin to say, no, maybe human nature is good. Uh, kids aren't little monsters. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so Taoism and legalism. I guess that was here. Taoism as a philosophy is actually pretty simple. The idea here is that China is in chaos because civilization is making people greedy. So what you do is you got to get rid of civilization itself. <laughs> so human beings ought to live with nature, be one with nature, lead simple lives, abandon the city, go cultivate your own garden, you know, make food for yourself and your family and just be happy. That's it. That's all you need to do. That's the basic idea behind Taoism. And it was uh, propagated by this fellow named Lao Tzu if he had existed. If he had existed, he is slightly senior, but he's contemporaneous with Confucius. I don't know if Lao Tzu exists or not, but I think there was someone who did compile the text into the Tao Te Ching or into the Lao Tzu the text, the book. Right? Um, the other great philosopher from Taoism is uh, Zhuangzi. Uh, he's also uh, like uh, Liu Bang, a man from the south. He's from the Yangtze River Valley. Uh, not valley, from the Yangtze River region. Um, <clears throat> and Zhuangzi is famous for talking about how uh, uh, it's like uh, everything is uh, relative and so nothing really matters. <laughs> so in the, in the long span, in the super long span of time itself. I mean, I mean, forget time itself. Think about how long the earth has been around. The earth has been around for literally millions of years, right? The billions of years. From that perspective, do you think human beings matter? <laughs> I mean, the dinosaurs were alive for millions and millions of years. They died, they left bones, they left fossils, and that's it. Human beings have been around for, as species, human beings have been around for like 200,000 years. Much, much less than dinosaurs. We might go out in a blink of an eye when something bad happens, like a nuclear catastrophe or some sort of like, you know, some crazy disaster. Do we matter? Right? So from that great span of time, things don't matter. That's the point of uh, Zhuangzi. And so... You know, stop worrying <laughs> because of Taoist philosophy. <clears throat> uh, legalism is the philosophy that was adopted by the Qin dynasty that unified China. And the idea behind legalism is to strengthen the power of the government. That, that's what legalism is all, all about. Strengthen the power of the king, strengthen the power of the government. Uh, control the people, get the people to work for the country. That's, get the people to be loyal. That's the key thing. Uh, the legalists really hated the Confucians because in Confucianism, notice that you know, family comes first, right? The, of the five human relationships, the most relationship, most important one is parent-child. Number two is the government and you. So if that's the case, if your parents, if your father, if your mother is being chased by the cops and they come to your house, what should you do? Should you hand them over to the cops or should you hide them? And the Confucian answer is obvious, obvious and simple. You should hide them. I, I kind of agree with this, by the way. Um, and, you know, the legalists just go like, no, that actually strengthens the power of the family and it weakens the power of the state. It should be the reverse. <laughs> you should, you know, if the cops are after your parents, you should hand over your parents to the cops. <laughs> That's the legalist answer. Um, and so the legalists and the Confucians really hate each other. Um, and that's part of the reason why when China was unified, 
uh, the first emperor of China basically said, we're going to have only legalism in China and we're going to ban the other philosophies. And if anybody's caught with those books, we're going to burn them. Uh, well, not, we're going to kill them. Uh, he literally built, not built, he literally dug a giant hole and got, a, got scholars around China who didn't give up their philosophies and dumped them into that giant hole and then buried them alive. <laughs> and he got their books and he burned those books. That's called the burning of the books and the burying of the scholars. So the first emperor of China for you. He really wanted legalism. All right. So this Confucianism is adopted by uh, Han Wu Di. Although Han Wu Di understood that you know the whole point of the Han Dynasty is to mix and match and be subtle and, and be uh, what's the right word and be nuanced about it and not be too over overly strict with it. But by the time you know. Uh, you get to the tail end of the dynasty. Uh, people have forgotten about that and they're, they're becoming more and more strict Confucians. Um, and another thing that's happened is that the 400 years of peace has created a gap between the rich and the poor. And now you, we're beginning to see lots of landless people. And these landless people begin to go to the rich landlords and the rich landlords slowly have become the new aristocrats. And the landless people go to the landlords and they beg the landlords so that they can till the land and they pay rent to the landlords and they live on the landlord's land. So surprise, surprise, when things start to go bad, uh, when there's a major rebellion, the landlords basically get their tenant farmers and suit them up in armor. And now, in, voila, he has an instant mini army to fight on his behalf. And the Han Dynasty towards the tail end, begins to all collapse. <clears throat> After a massive rebellion, a general comes from the north to control the government. The general is a tyrant. Uh, the aristocrats, or to be more precise, the landlords throughout the country basically rise in rebellion. They bring their tiny armies, they gather, and in the end, they do defeat that general. And when they defeat the general, they can agree on how to keep the country unified and the country falls apart. And that's how China did gets divided in 220 AD, right? <clears throat> so the dynasty collapses and for almost 400 years, after 400 years of unity, there's almost 400 years of disunity. China's divided. During this period of disunity, uh, Northern China has a massive influx of quote unquote barbarians from Central Asia, right? Uh, Mongols, uh, Turks, uh, uh, not really Mongols yet, but proto-Mongols, proto-Manchus, Turks, all these people, you know, these nomadic peoples arrive from the, from the steppes and they come to China and they overrun the North China Plain with their horses and they set up their own governments. Uh, Chinese civilians, uh, Chinese uh, governments basically flee. Many of them go south. A lot of them stay, but many of them go south and they set up their own shops in southern China. Uh, but even in southern China, uh, <clears throat> what they find out is that in the mountains, there's all these non-Chinese people living there along the coast. And further down south, there are all these other non-Chinese people living there as well, the cousins of the Yue, for example, the people who will be known as the Vietnamese, um, or the people who will be known as the, uh, uh, the Miao, right? The, the, all these like non-Chinese people are living down there. And so... Uh, the people who fled uh, the North China Plain basically intermingle with these people in Southern China and you get that intermingling culture down there as well. But I think the more interesting intermingling culture happens in the North. Why? Well, that's because these quote unquote barbarians in the North, they don't really want to accept Confucianism because they're not really culturally Chinese yet. And you know, it's like, well, we don't really believe in this stuff and we don't have these like rituals and stuff that, that you guys follow, our rituals are different. Uh, but we do want some sort of religion. Uh, we don't really like Taoism because Taoism is too affiliated with you know, Southern China. And so they latch on to Buddhism. Buddhism was a new religion that was coming from Central Asia to China by around like 100 AD. And when the barbarians come, the barbarians, you know, like latch on to Buddhism enthusiastically. And so you get this fusion of Chinese culture with nomadic culture and a fusion of Chinese culture with Buddhism. Um, and it is from this fusion that you get 
the founding families of the Sui and the Tang. So uh, if you trace the origins of the imperial family of the Sui dynasty or the imperial family of the Tang dynasty, very quickly you actually get to uh, uh, the non-Chinese uh, uh, nomadic horsemen. <clears throat> but by the time they conquer China in 589 AD, they're fully Chinese in the sense that you know, they, they speak Chinese, they're now culturally Chinese, uh, and their religion is this blend of uh, you know, Buddhism and a little bit of Taoism and Confucianism and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, and Confucianism. So you know, that's who these guys are. <laughs> I mean, it's a very interesting culture that begins to emerge. Um, all right, <clears throat> so this 400 year period after the fall of the Han Dynasty is very important. If the Han Dynasty was the dynasty that set the basis for what it, you know, and what the Chinese call themselves, you know, uh, themselves the Han people, uh, this divided period is the period that basically defines what it means to be Chinese. And what it means to be Chinese is not bloodline. What it means to be Chinese is cultural. Can you read and write Chinese? <laughs> Can you speak Chinese fluently? I mean, these are the things. That, that's what it means to be Chinese. Do you accept, you know, uh, the, the, the religion? Uh, do you, not the religion. Do you accept the culture? And as long as you accept the culture, you are now Chinese. And the Sui and the Tang, so this map is of the Tang Dynasty, is that unified, newly unified China. Now, this newly unified China doesn't actually last that long. The Sui Dynasty unifies China in 589 AD, and the unity of the Tang Dynasty lasts until 755. The Sui Dynasty does essentially a repeat of the Qin Dynasty. They do massive construction projects and they fight these overseas wars uh, multiple times. And that causes people to be unhappy with the imperial family and the dynasty. And after an internal rebellion, uh, a relative of the imperial family of the Sui Dynasty, a member of the Li family, takes over and they establish the Tang Dynasty. There you go. Uh, now, <clears throat> although the construction projects were highly unpopular, I must say it is completed and it is a great success. The Grand Canal is a canal that links from the Yellow River to the Yangtze River. And by this point in time, the Yangtze River is, is becoming the center of the Chinese economy. And as it becomes the center of the Chinese economy, more and more over time, like today, for example, Shanghai is the largest city in China. It's not Beijing, the capital, it's Shanghai down here. But <clears throat> as the Yellow River, no, sorry, as, the, as the Yangtze River becomes the center of the Chinese economy, the food and the products produced along this river is shipped along the Grand Canal to the north and the people living in the north now have access to stuff made in the south. And that is, I think, one of the key things that maintains the unity of China. Because as long as you can use the canal, you don't have to use the water out here, which is far more dangerous. The canal is, is a lot easier to move. Right. Um, so the Sui Dynasty, uh, like the Qin Dynasty, you know, fell uh, very quickly. But like the Qin Dynasty, it also had some major impacts that are long-lasting. The impact that's not long-lasting in the case of the Sui Dynasty is... Uh, the Han Dynasty had control over Northern Korea. So the Sui Dynasty tries to do the repeat and tries to control Northern Korea once again, but they fail. The Tang Dynasty eventually will succeed. Uh, they will control up to here, up to Pyongyang. <coughs> so the Northern third of the, of the Korean Peninsula will be part of the Tang Dynasty. I don't know why it's not there in here, but it's okay. So the Tang Dynasty, this is a very interesting dynasty. Um, <coughs> Yeah, the Sui and the Tang, as I said, are Sinified barbarians. Uh, as Sinified barbarians, the women are far more active. They're, they're not like uh, Chinese women in uh, uh, later dynasties or previous dynasties. Uh, Tang women, for example, ride horses. They play polo. <laughs> um, if you look at paintings uh, of Tang women, Tang women tend to be uh, plumper. Uh, they're Rubenesque, uh, they're not uh, thin. Um, and the Tang, they, they like to import wine. They like to import wine from the Armenian merchants all the way from out west, and they drank wine. That was, that, you know, they, they didn't drink uh, rice wine. They, uh, they drank uh, you know, uh, grape wine. 
red wine or white wine, probably red wine, right? And it is during the Tang Dynasty that uh, you have the one and only female emperor. So Wu Zetian was initially uh, the emperor's concubine, and then uh, after the emperor dies, she becomes the wife of the next emperor, which is unheard of in Chinese culture. Uh, usually you, you can't marry your husband's lover. I mean, you can't marry your father's lover. That's just seen as incest in Chinese culture, but that happened in the Tang Dynasty. And after it happened, uh, I think uh, her husband died, and then she rules on behalf of her child, and then eventually she gets rid of her child and she rules as herself. And she is the only woman in Chinese history to rule as emperor. Okay. <clears throat> um, after she is deposed, uh, there is a period of, you know, uh, a brief period of renaissance under the Tang, but that comes to an end with the Andushan Rebellion in 755 AD. So the unity of China only lasts from 6, 589 to 755, and from you know there's a period of war. So really, it's from 618 to 755. Um, and after the Andushan Rebellion, China, Tang China is basically mired in rebellion again. So if you go from here, 220 AD to 960 AD. It's a really long period. 220 to 960 is what? 740 years. And out of that 740 years, the real period of stability is from 618 to 755 of roughly 140 years. So there's 600 years of total and uh, 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 600 years of turmoil and unrest in China. <clears throat> uh, but culturally, it's a very significant uh, period. And also uh, the, the system that the Tang Dynasty implemented becomes the standard that's set for Koreans and Japanese state that, that will come later. So when I talk about Japan, I'll talk about the, uh, the Tang style state. And uh, we'll do it more carefully there. We're gonna run out of time. So actually I might, well, let's see what happens. So <clears throat> after the Tang Dynasty falls to a internal rebellion, there is a period called the uh, Five Dynasties, Ten Kingdoms, where for about 50 years, China is in turmoil again. But the Sung will unify China. And the Sung is divided into two periods. The Northern Sung, when it rules almost all of China from 960 to 1127, and the Southern Sung, when it rules only Southern China from 1127 to 1279. So that's the Sung here, and that's the Southern Sung here. So what happened? <clears throat> So one of the things that happened is that uh, it, during the uh, five dynasties and 10 kingdoms, during the period after the fall of the Tang dynasty, as the Sung dynasty was reunifying, these Northern barbarians, the proto-Manchus, they called themselves the Jurchens at the time, conquer the extreme Northern tidbit of China. And when the, sorry, not the Jurchens, the Ketons, when the Ketons conquer the extreme northern tidbit over here, the Sung Dynasty asks the Jurchens further to the north for help. And the Jurchens oblige. I said, all right, when we defeat the Liao, we'll take half of Liao, and when you guys defeat the Liao, you take the southern half. And so the Sung and the Jurchens attack the Ketons, called, you know, they created a country called the Liao. The Liao eventually are defeated, but before they're defeated, the Liao actually defeat the Sung army. <laughs> so the, La the Sung don't win against the Liao. The Liao are essentially are single-handedly defeated by the Jurchens. So when the Jurchens defeat the Liao, they call themselves the new country Jin. And the Jin basically have defeated the Liao and the Sung dynasty says, well, as per our agreement, can we get you know, the southern half of Liao? <laughs> and the Jin, you know, the Jurchens say, why? You didn't do squad. We're the ones who defeated them, no. And so the Sung Dynasty goes to war against the Jin <coughs> and loses. And when they lose, the Jin basically take the northern part of Sung, going all the way here. What happens next is that the Sung then try to talk to the people further north of the Jin, who are the Mongols. At this point, they are, they are really the Mongols. <laughs> and they make an agreement with the Mongols saying, all right, the Mongols should attack the Jin, we'll attack the Jin, and then we'll divide the Jin and we'll take back China and you guys can take the northern part, the nomadic part. Guess what happens? 
yeah, <laughs> the Sung can't win against the Jin, but the Mongols do win against the Jin. <laughs> and the Sung basically can't get the North back, and the Mongols basically take the Jin, and the Mongols defeat the Western Sha, and the Mongols have the northern half of China. And the Sung said, give us back the northern part of China. And the Mongols say, no, you didn't do squat. And the Mongols and the Jin, uh, Mongols and the Sung go to war, and surprise, surprise, the Mongols win and take over all of China. So uh, in terms of diplomatic history, the Sung dynasty is a dynasty you don't want to uh, copy. <laughs> it's a terrible mistake. <laughs> now, <clears throat> in terms of domestic policy, however, the Sung dynasty is actually pretty darn good. So here's number one thing that, that's actually pretty good. Um, they understood that China was mired in civil war for 800 years, for a long time, because the generals were too strong. So one of the things they wanted to make sure was they wanted to make sure that the generals would not be as powerful as they were before. So they tried to strengthen the power of the, of the military. Uh, sorry, they tried to strengthen the power of the emperor and hand over to the emperor as much of the military as possible. So they did that, and that did prevent internal rebellions. So the Sung dynasty, uh, unlike the Han dynasty, unlike the Tang dynasty, did not fall to an internal rebellion. But the army was simply not large enough and it wasn't strong enough to be able to defeat stronger nomadic enemies. And that was the problem with the Sung dynasty. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like, you know, you, you learn a lesson, but it, it, sometimes you go too far. Uh, but, you know, <clears throat> the other thing that the Sung did was to strengthen the power of the emperor. <coughs> Excuse me. To strengthen the power of the emperor. Uh, they began to implement civil service exams. Now, civil service exams in its, uh, na uh, in its uh, uh, earliest form had already existed since Han Dynasty times. But the one that existed in the Han Dynasty times weren't really civil service exams. And the civil service exams that existed in the Tang Dynasty times really weren't civil service exams. The, the, the exams in the Tang Dynasty times were like exams to see how cultural you were. Whereas the Sung Dynasty civil service exams were real civil service exams. I think this is the height of the civil service exams. This is the best civil service exams that China has actually produced. And what they asked on their tests were, you know, uh, China's, uh, you know, Sung Dynasty's uh, foreign policy issue is right now dealing with the barbarians to the north, the Sha, the Liao, the Tibetans, uh, you know, and the barbarians to the west and the south, Tibetans and the Vietnamese. What should you do? What should we do? What do you propose? Uh, as an administrator, one of the key things you'll have, is, one of the key duties you will have is to make sure that the water flows. What should you do in a time of uh, drought, right? What should you do when there is a flood and, you know, the water dikes break? Uh, what, are the, what are the technological and administrative know-how necessary for you to run the government, for you to be a member of the Chinese government. These were the type of questions that were asked by the Sung Dynasty in the civil service exams, in the Sung Dynasty civil service exams. Um, and I think they were great. There was one problem, however. <clears throat> there was also questions about how to interpret Confucianism. <laughs> um, because, you know, how to interpret Confucianism basically, you know, directly translated to how you should actually run the government as well. And one of the things that happened was there was an internal strife uh, inside the Sung Dynasty between two factions. One faction wanted to implement reforms and the other faction wanted to implement, well, not impl didn't want to implement the reforms and wanted to stay the course and hold on to the system that the founding emperors had created the founding three emperors had created, or the founding two emperors, I forget, it doesn't matter. Right. <clears throat> should we stay with the original system or should we do massive reforms? Um, and, you know, the civil service exams basically became the litmus test to see which side you supported. And whoever was in charge at the time would put these questions up and if the side in, in favor of reforms basically sent out uh, civil service exams and the students took it and they came back with replies saying, I don't really support the reforms. I think, you know, reforms are a bad idea. Confucius say X, Y, and Z about reforms. Then these guys are not hired. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> and you can do the reverse, right? The, it's 
that I support the reforms because reforms are necessary. Manchester says that we need all these things, so you know we should we should have reforms too. You, know, you hire all these guys. Uh, so you have this internal factional strife, and it was during this internal factional strife that China loses the North to the Jin. And from that moment onwards, uh, the civil service exams basically, uh, uh, well, actually, no, the, the, the reforms are more blamed for, the reforms are blamed for the failure to keep the North and are blamed for losing the North. Yeah. Even though they're not to be blamed. <laughs> and so what happens is that in the future exams that are going to be held, not under the Sung Dynasty, but under the Ming Dynasty here, the questions are all going to be about Confucianism, and there's only one correct answer. And that's terrible. That just basically forces people to memorize things, and it takes people, it, it, it robs people more and more of their creativity and the way to actually like you know, solve problems and stuff like that. So that's why it's bad. Uh, but um, up until the Sung Dynasty, you know, Chinese technological advances are... are, are uh, uh, are rapid and very impressive, right? I mean, they have steelworks. Um, it is during the Sung Dynasty that they invent uh, uh, gunpowder and uh, uh, the, the compass. Uh, it is during the Han Dynasty that they invent paper. Uh, it is during the Tang Dynasty that they begin to create porcelain. And the porcelain, as we understand it, is perfected in the Sung Dynasty. I mean, hey, <clears throat> right? So, like, there's all these, like, scientific and technological advances up until here, and then after this, uh, it slows down to a trickle. And I, I, I blame it on the educational system for that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so the Mongols, the people who conquer China, right? The Mongol Empire and their vastness will reach this. Uh, Genghis Khan himself really only conquers, like, the northern part here. It's his son uh, that conquers, like, it's his son's generation that conquers all this territory. And then it is his grandson's generation that conquers all of this in uh, Middle East and Southern China. So in three generations, the Mongols will conquer the world. But in about 150 years, they will lose that empire. <laughs> now, <clears throat> despite the fact that they'll lose the empire in those 150 years, those 150 years are critical because the Mongols are the first to really conceive of a single world government. And to go with that single world government, they conceive of a trade network that will support that single world government. And that trade network is this land-based trade network, which is based on the old Silk Road. Silk is the Chinese product going west. And on this Silk Road, uh, th things like glass used to go this way in Roman times. You have this old Silk Road that's connected by the Mongols. And as you can see, they have access to the sea here and they have access to the sea here. So what they're going to do is they're going to connect the sea route that exists here. Now, the Mongols aren't particularly good boats. Uh, they're going to try and invade Japan with boats and they're going to fail. They're going to try and invade Southeast Asia, Java, uh, Sri, Sri Vijaya with boats, and that comes, that's going to fail too. But they do encourage merchants from Arabia and Persia and India to come to China by boats. And you actually have Arab merchants living in Chinese port cities of Guangzhou, right? And you have Muslim merchants living in China that came by the Silk Road and by boat. So the Mongols, when they conceive of a single world government, also conceive of a single world trading system. And that's key. So the idea here is that China is going to be the production center that produces uh, silk and porcelain. And that is going to be the one to bring in uh, silver and gold and other wealth into China because they, they can just outproduce everybody else because there's just so many more people. When they connect it to the here, what they find out is eventually that India will be the producer of cotton cloth called calico and spices, specifically black pepper. And Southeast Asia is going to be the producer of specific spices that can't be produced anywhere else, like not like mace and cloves. And the Middle East <coughs> will discover that they are the ones who have access to all this stuff over here, and they can be the middleman to sell those stuff at a premium to people further over here, out west. The Byzantines 
actually are okay with this because even though the Byzantines are over here, they don't have to go through the Middle East. They can actually go to the Black Sea and then go this way to reach Mongolia. Uh, if I am not mistaken, Marco Polo does precisely that. Marco Polo goes to Constantinople, goes across this way to Mongolia, and then he takes boats and then comes back into Persia. And because Persia is part of the Mongol Empire, Marco Polo goes this way, and then from the Black Sea, goes through Constantinople and goes back to Venice. Notice that Marco Polo does not go through Muslim territory. He goes through non-Muslim territory ruled by the Mongols. And that's because the Muslims have a travel ban on Christians going through Muslim territory, right? Um, only Muslim merchants are allowed to go through Muslim territory. And that means then that these Africans living over here and these Europeans living over here have to pay out of the nose to buy anything that's coming out of here. And that's why pepper is ridiculously expensive in Europe. Right? Spice has become ridiculously expensive in Europe. It's lit the spices are literally worth its weight in gold. Right? If you weigh gold and you weigh spices, that's, that's the cost. <laughs> it's the same. Right? It's like you're eating gold. It's crazy. <clears throat> okay. So let's uh, wrap this up. 